I am delighted to be chairing this panel. Um, I am Vara Nevro. I teach at Southern Connecticut State University, and I am introducing our speakers. Um, the first will be, um, okay, Rasha, <laughs> I'm gonna do this badly. Um, pardon me. Uh, Raja uh, Alja Rawa, and she is a PhD candidate in literature at the University of Texas at Dallas, and she is a rhetoric instructor at the same school. Her research interests are ethnic, sorry, ethic, um, American literature, gender, and post-colonial thought, and I apologize for sounding tired because I am. <laughs> um, our next presentation will be by Lauren Agalus. Did I say that right? Um, and she will be presenting on, um, let's see, Lauren, I've lost your introduction. Hmm. Lauren, could you tell us about yourself quickly? Oh, yeah, sure, no problem. Um, I'm Lauren. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the University of the Philippines in Diliman, here in uh, Metro Manila in the Philippines. Um, and I, um, pre prior to uh, being in the academe, I was uh, I had worked in publishing both in Manila and the UK. Um, and then at the moment. Uh, I'm interested, of course, in Virginia Woolf as a research uh, part, one of my research interests, if that's not obvious yet. Um, but aside from uh, Woolf, there's also ur urban studies and uh, modernism and food studies that I'm currently interested in. So that's it for me. Thank you so much for doing that. And my apologies for not doing it. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> okay. And our last uh, presenter will be Kimberly Coates, who is an associate professor of English and director of the American Culture Studies Program at Bowling Green State University. And her work has appeared in Literature and Medicine, Journal of Narrative Theory, um, Sci Art, uh, Wolf Studies Annual, and the collection Queer Bloomsbury edited by Madeline Detloff and Brenda Helt. Her article, Audition, Aud hmm, this is definitely a challenge. challenging Aud Audacious. Moment. Thank you, I'm trying. I know you <laughs> Thank are. you, Kimberly. Her article, Audacious Limbs, Dance as Revolutionary Praxis in Emily Holmes Coleman's surrealistic novel, The Shutter of Snow will be published in the upcoming issue of Feminist Modernist Studies. And she is currently at work on two larger projects, Emily Holmes Coleman, an American surrealist and audacious limbs, <laughs> um, dance, politics, and women's writing between the wars. Okay, and we're ready to go. So let our first presenter begin and we will take notes. Thank you very much, Vara, um, and uh, nice to meet you all. I'm really excited for this panel. Um, so my paper's title is The Agency of Silence and Wolves to the Lighthouse. I'll be reading from my paper, uh, if you don't mind that. Um, Silence in power paradigms has been viewed as a sign of oppression and subjugation, especially women's silence has been per perceived prior to the 20th century as, quote, a place of oppression, the mark of women's exclusion from public spheres of life and from representation as speakers in a text. Um, End quote. Hence, one would assume that breaking the silence of the victims of patriarchy in the is the most significant strategy to, to give voice to those oppressed. Definitely, this could be true. Nevertheless, an examination of Virginia Woolf's work would reveal an alternative attitude toward the power dynamics of silence in most of her novels like The Waves, Mrs. Dalloway, and To the Lighthouse. As a modernist writer, Wolf contributes to shifting the norms of, fiction, of writing 
in fiction as she develops the new techniques of narration, building plots, and creating characters. In her article, Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Brown, Wolf indicates that the shift in writing reflects a shift in all the human relations. In, it's a quote, uh, uh, all the human relations, those between masters and servants, husbands and wives, parents and children, end quote. The revolution against the writing tradition of the Victorian age invites a new consideration for the paradigm of speech and silence in the writing of the modernist, modernist writers. In To the Lighthouse, Silas is a prominent and it is observed in Wolf's tendency to narrate the inwardness of her characters through the use of the stream of, of consciousness technique. In what follows, I I argue that silence into the lighthouse is deployed to forge a form of resistance, and it is a way to transform complicity within a paradigm of power relations in the novel through which subordinate forces reclaim agency. The historical narrative of power dynamics within patriarchy in the early 20th century would create the assumption that Wolf finds in creating a space of silence for her female characters a refuge to avoid confrontation with the outer patriarchal force. It is certainly true that in power relations, Silence and powerlessness are generally considered two sides of the same coin. Literary critic Riel Rao and Moholtre uh, state that, quote, the articulation between silence and powerlessness is almost a common sense uh, within Western culture, an assumption that is re reified across literary, progressive, academic, and activist contexts. Therefore, it could be suggested that Wolf, as a feminist writer, initiates, initiates a transitional phase in the discourse of power by her distinctive use of silence in her novels. Wolf uses silence into the lighthouse as a structure of power that women and subordinates use to resist authoritarian dominance within the novel's community. In discussing the role of the daughters of educated men in discouraging war in the three guineas, Wolf calls for a change in the attitude of these uh, young women in, in the, to the church by absenting themselves from it. Wolf states, quote, to absent yourself, that is easier than to, easier to speak aloud. Therefore, it is worth watching very carefully to see what effect the experiment of absenting oneself has had, if any. The results are positive and they are encouraging, end quote. An analogy between this absence, which Wolf calls the uh, passive experiment and the use of silence into the lighthouse could be drawn as Wolf uses both of, uh, as a form of communication and resistance to authority. Such analogy uh, intensifies the notion of the transitional phase in the feminist discourse mentioned above. Since women are still unable to speak for themselves, silence or absence would be utilized to help them resist. On the other hand, Patricia, Patricia Lawrence suggests a dimensional perspective for interpreting, to interpreting silence as she explains that silences woven into the fabric of women's, of women's text can be an absence or a presence, end quote. She says that the interpretation of silence according to the established patriarchal values depends on an angle of a view. She suggests that if women and silence is viewed from outside, it's a mark of, quote, absence and powerlessness, end quote. However, the same silence is viewed from inside can be viewed as a presence, and this is a quote again, it can be viewed as a presence and uh, as a text waiting to be read, end quote. Social and cultural aspects interfere in interpreting silence in text, and the tension between these forces give, give, gives rise uh, to different views of silence and not only as a sign of submissiveness. Wolf depicts silence into the light hive using this stream of consciousness narrative technique. She is almost, she is amongst several other modern writers who adopt this technique, technique as a, a, way, a way, a quote, a way to challenging the traditional structural patterns associated with the novel. Much of the interaction between the characters in, in To the Lighthouse is a result of their inner reflection that it attained during moments of silence. And these moments, moments articulate the tension between the inner and outer forces among the characters and their surroundings. Yet some scholars have focused on sil and silence in Wolf's work as a linguistic feature wh wh where some details are left for the reader to articulate or to interpret while 
sorry, to interpret what the silent gesture suggests. Change states that silence into the lighthouse presents blanks in meaning that the reader should uh, concretize, concretize to fill the gaps in the message. Quote, the blanks in this novel challenge the reader's insight to unravel the mystery of language and expand the refrigerability of science. Similarly, Lawrence in her reading of Silence and Wolves a work uh, describes that Wolf creates a presence by using silence. She suggests that Wolf, quote, creates a lexicon of silence, punctuation of silence, and metaphors of silence that, that signals the mind feelings, particularly the unconscious uh, conscious in fiction. End quote. In order to understand the significance of silence to the lighthouse, it is substantial to compare it with the use of a speech among novel's characters. Wolf identifies power relations early in, the, in her novel. Mainly, she stresses, stresses on gender as the main contributor to the novel's paradigm of power. Mr. Ramsey, as a figure of power, is not presented in silence. As a man and a husband, Mr. Ramsey speaks aloud, and he exercises his authoritative power over his wife and his family. He explicitly demonstrates his power by defying his wife's assertion to her son of their visit to the light to the lighthouse the next day if the weather permits simply by stating that, quote, it won't be fine, end quote. Though Mrs. Ramsey's character is presented in an archetypical wife and mother in the novel, in, it, it is in her moment of silence it's in her moments of silence that expose her resistance to that role. To everyone in the in the novel, Mrs. Ramsey appears genuinely committed to her duties as a wife, mother, and a host. She also dares to share her views on marriage with with all women around her, encouraging them to get married and build and to build families. Yet she is aware that she has consumed her her life and beauty in taking responsibility of her husband, his money, and his books. But at the same time, she admits that she quote would. Never Never for a single second regret that her decision evade difficulties or slur over duties. End quote. However, silence articulates a different aspect of Mrs. Ramsey, Mrs. Ramsey's character. It is only at those silent moments away from her distracting social duties that she attains her privacy and gets a chance to reflect on her life. Even though Mrs. Ramsey, communi Mrs. Ramsey communicates her advice for women to get married, she silently admires their independence. She describes Lily, Lily Briscoe, Briscoe as she paints her picture as, quote, independent, independent little creature, end quote, and she likes her for that. Silence also gives uh, her a, 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 ch a chance to think outside of her role as a wife, and it allows her to become an investigator, it's a quote, quote, an investigator elucidating the social problem, end quote. Standing in silence at her drawing room window, Mrs. Ramsey is captured pondering upon some of the so uh, soci her society's problems, such as living conditions of the poor compared to the rich, unemployment and wages. The discrepancy of Mrs. Ramsey's thought in her silent moment and her action when socially involved reflects her social intelligence, not her, her, not her subjugation. Mrs. Ramsey possesses the, uh, the uh, quote, ability to manage her own emotions and her inner potential for positive relationships, end quote. And that is a crucial capacity for of the individual to socially, to be socially intelligent, according to Goldman. The, co uh, the scope of uh, social intelligence also includes the ability to enrich personal relationships like empathy and concern. In her relation with the males in the novel, Mrs. Ramsey demonstrates the ability to understand their minds and to respond adequately to their needs, giving them sympathy and reassurance. She is not a nurse self self-centered, uh, and she always considers others' interests as a priority. This trait empowers Mrs. Ramsey as a female character who responds, who responds intelligently to the males who originally perceived themselves as superiors. Silence in Mrs. Ramsey's relationship with her husband is a manifestation of resisting oppression. She finds it a shelter from confrontation with her, with her husband. When, Mrs., Ms., when Mr. Ramsey Verbally abuses Mrs. Ramsey, she reflects in silence on his brutality and the lack of consideration of others, of people's uh, feelings. That's in the quote. Mrs. Ramsey gives, uh, gives up replying to him, thinking that, quote, there was nothing to be said, end quote. He, her, silence, her silent response does not mean accepting the humiliation. In fact, her silence is intentional, and it is a manifestation of resisting her husband's behavior and considering it an outrage 
uh, outrage of human decency. After the dinner scene, Mrs. Ramsey gets a chance to be alone in silence. This silence ignites her creative urge. She enters a state of solitude where she recites what they read at the dinner table. As it, uh, quote, began to washing from side to side of her mind rhythmically, and as they wash, lit up the dark of her mind, end quote. The beauty of what she recollects captures her feeling and gets her to grab a book and read. A shift in the type of her thought happens again in the solitude. While she is reading, her husband tries to distract her as he slaps his thighs. At this moment, she resists his influence by looking at him silently. She seems to go through a genuine struggle between her inner self and the patriarchal forces of her, force of her husband. She declares that she would give up her solitude, solitude if he seems to need her, but that goes against her real wish to continue reading in silence. Mrs. Ramsey perceives this moment as a sublime through which she dreams and discovers new thoughts and ideas. She, she read, it's a quote, quote, she reads, she read, and so reading was, she was ascending. She felt on the top, on the summit, how satisfying, how restful, end quote. She recognizes the value of the intellectual work, intellectual work. She finds in silence an opportunity to resist any outer influence that would have deprived her, deprived her of appreciating poetry. Quote, and then there, uh, there it was, suddenly entire. She held it in her hands, beautiful and reasonable, clear and complete. The essence sucked out of life and held around here the solid, end quote. As a feminist writer, Wolf tries to pr protest the image of the subjugated female. She repels against the Victorian tradition of the angel in the house. In her essay, Professions for Women, Wolf accounts for her tendency to kill the female phantom that keeps was wasting her time and distracting her from writing. Wolf calls this phantom uh, the angel in the house. Wolf describes this phantom as a female that, quote, was intensely sympathetic. She she was immensely charming. She was utterly unselfish. She excelled in difficult art, arts of family life. She sacrificed herself daily." End quote. A resemblance appears between the description of the angel of the, of the house and the character of Mrs. Ramsay. And such a resemblance re raises a question if Mrs. Ramsay's, if Mrs. Ramsay's death suggests that Wolf anticipates considering Mrs. Ramsay as an example of the oppressed woman. So she decided to put Mrs. Ramsay to, into an eternal silence by her sudden death. Her death is also a gesture that Wolf opposes Mrs. Ramsey's att attitude in the novel, even though she is depicted resisting in silence. Hence, silence proves itself again as a, res as a, resist as a resistant to patriarchy to the lighthouse, as Wolf silences the female who seemingly appears to accept, accept the patriarchal oppression. With Mrs. Ramsey's death, the novel announces Lily's triumphs over her. Lily is, an, is the unmarried woman and the art maker. Upon Mrs. Ramsey's death, Lily contemplates, quote, Mrs. Ramsey is faded and gone. We can override her wishes, improve away her limits, old fashioned ideas, end quote. Lily also thinks that she has quote, triumphs over Mrs. Ramsey, end quote. And Minnie and Paul's marriage turns out to be a failure and she herself has not married, but still stands next, stands next to her picture, picture painting. Further, silence has a spatial dimension in the light, into the lighthouse, and women's ability to understand these features empowers them. In Wolf's essay, A Room of One's Own, she emphasizes the need to, for spatial privacy to, as a condition for women to be artistically creative. Indeed, the concept of a private space can be traced metaphorically into the lighthouse represented in moments of silence. In creating a space of silence for her female characters, Wolf utilizes it as utilizes it as a, a structure of power that negates women's complicity to male's dominance in the novel. For instance, Mr. Tansley, as at the dinner, at the dinner, ta dinner table scene, feels detached from the company. Annoyed by the situation, he considers their speech nonsense and fragments, and he felt, quote, extremely, even physically uncomfortable, end quote. As a, as a common attitude of males in the novel, he asserts his, his uh, he starts to seek reassurance from people around him. In this scene, women's power is presented in the 
their ability to read Mill's inner social conflict that is narrated in silence. Wolf gives the floor for Lily Prisco to take note of Mr. Tansley's struggle as she observes his, his need. She challenges Ms. Mr. Tansley, who condemns women earlier in the novel of their inability to be creative and to make art, as he states that, quote, women can't paint, women can't write, and end of quote. Uh, in this situation, Lily Briscoe opts to stay silent and thought, quote, why should I help him to relieve himself, end quote. Lily retains from comforting him and opts to stay silent to defy Mr. Tam uh, Tamsley's masculine forms that tries to sub subdue and humiliate women. Likewise, as Leslie Prisco observed Mrs. Ramsey and Paul alluding to marriage, she feels the conflict between her inner self and outer social force. She, she silence as uh, at the time, at this time is a shelter for her to ponder on things and to discover what she truly wants. She resists the acclaimed temptation of finding love and getting married. Quote, what happened to her, especially saying with the Ramseys was to be made to feel violently two opposite things at the same time. That's what you feel was one, well, that's that's what I feel was the other. And then they fought together in her mind, end quote. In such silent moments, she realizes her personal preference and resists the pressure of her surroundings. Consequently, she acknowledges that she does not want to get married and she, quote, needs to not undergo the, the degrada degradation. She departs from their conversation and starts to think about her art. Lily Presco opts to preserve her silence to ensure her freedom from social pressure and finds a space to be creative. She appears constantly trying to avoid conversing about topics that increase pressure on her. Silence is her preferable condition in which she can think about improving her art. According to Kenny, uh, quote, art, artists and other creative people have a long made use of silence in their work, finding silence conducive to their muse or incorporating it into the very fabric of their art, end quote. In her silence, uh, Lily remembers that she does not finish her picture and she wants to finish it since, uh, quote, a solution had made had come to her, she knew now what she wanted to do, end quote. Lily's real realization transcend, transcends a choice relevant only to her painting. It includes her decision to make art, not to comply with the norms of her society. When Mr. Ramsey approaches her, he inter interrupts, her work, interrupts her working in silence and breaks her, breaks her privacy. Quote, every time he approached, he was walking down and up the terrace, ruined, up, uh, ruined approached, chaos approached, she could not paint, end quote. His presence impedes her creative, creativity. She could not see the color, she could, this is a quote, she could not uh, see the color, she could not see the lines, end quote. Lily strives to keep her space, trying to avoid submitting into his tyranny. She possesses also the ability to read men's mind and she starts to be aware of Mr. Ramsey's demand. She is scared to be forced to submit as it, it, ha it has happened to Mrs. Ramsey. Lily consider it Mrs. Ramsey's fault as she used to surrender to him. Lily tries to resist and not to respond. So she stays silent and that makes Mrs. Mr. Ramsey sigh, quote, to the fall he waited. Was, not, was she not going to say anything? Did she not see what he wanted from her, end quote. She resists him and refuses to submit, uh, quote, in complete silence, she stood there grasping her paintbrush, end quote. Undoubtedly, the solution for Lily is art. Her art is a means of resistance in this situation and silence is the medium. Indeed, To the Lighthouse is a novel replete, replete with silence. In feminist discourse, silence should not be interpreted as a sign of complicity to patriarchy or of female, or, or sorry, or women's passivity. Indeed, investigating the use, the use of silence into the lighthouse reveals that it is utilized as a deliberative strategy to resist authority, negate complicity, and gain power. The individual in the novel find refuge in silence when their inner force encounters the outer force within patriarchy. Similarly, as silence is an act of resistance, empowering women, it also ensures social, spatial privacy that fosters their creative urge. Silence gives Mrs. Mrs. Ramsey the ability to resist the authority of her husband and it also gives Prisco, uh, Lily Prisco a chance to realize what she wants in life and helps her to be creative and to make art. Ultimately, creativity empowers women as well. And that's for me. Thank you. Share that.
you, you're muted, Vara. Irritating. It muted myself. Um, that was just amazing. Uh, and I'm very glad that we are sharing papers in this uh, conference because now we can cherish what you've said in a print format, um, which is something to be very grateful for. Um, so our next speaker will be Lauren. And um, let the glorious speech begin. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. Um, I will um, also resend the link for the benefit of those who may have just joined. Um, let me just copy that. Um, and then um, you will see it on your chat box. Um, let me know if there's any trouble with that. But I think um, it's the same one as earlier. So it should yep. be fine for everyone. Thank you so much. I'll also start sharing my slides. So just please do give me a few minutes to, well, seconds, hopefully, <laughs> to just put that up. Uh, once I find where it is. And actually, um, Rasha, you might want to repost yours while Lauren is looking um, to get her set up because several people, I think, came in while you were talking and they probably can't see the paper. Aha, success. Yes. Um, I just want to make sure that that's being seen by everyone. Is that all right for all? Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks for everyone um, for being here um, again. Well, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. So um, I am again, I'm Lauren. Um, I'm here to uh, share with you um, a really a developing paper, a paper that I am developing at the moment uh, with this working title, which is The Objects of Life, uh, Approaches to Virginia Woolf's A Society. Um, again, like I said, hopefully you have access to the paper, uh, to the bullet points rather of what this presentation will be like. Um, I have also included there some other points that I may not be able to mention today uh, due to time constraints, um, but hopefully you will get to have a conversation about these uh, points later on uh, at the end of the program. Um, so again, while it would have been wonderful to meet everyone in person, um, this is, you know, we'll have to make do with this platform for now. But um, again, I'd like to offer my uh, sincerest thanks to the conference organizers, to Amy, uh, for, of course, um, uh, welcoming us uh, so warmly here. And uh, thanks, everyone, for being here, um, especially if it is very early for you uh, at the moment. Um, and it is the Sunday at the same time. So um, lastly, I'd like to thank uh, Rasha and Kimberly. Um, well, congratulations in advance and uh, well, well wishes to my co uh, co-panelists today okay um so so there um i will begin right now so a, a society as has been brought up probably in um a number of sessions uh, ago uh, in the start of the conference it is uh, a story that has come from the collection 19 uh, published in 1921 which is entitled um monday or tuesday uh it, uh, in the simplest terms, it really is, uh, as according to Christine Rainier, um, a story that features a group of girls or young women who form a society and set out to find what has happened to the male children of their mothers. So, of course, it's a very short way of putting it. Um, but, of course, for uh, in, with that regard, I would like to draw my analysis um, just uh, on based on three characters at the moment. So, uh, that includes Cassandra, the story Story's narrator. There's also um, Florinda, who is tagged as the first to come to her senses. And finally, one of the group's most outspoken women, uh, whose name is um, Castalia, who is tagged as the impure woman. So um, with these women in mind, uh, these are the questions that I've been working on, I am working on at the moment. And some of these have been tweaked according to the call for papers as well for this conference. And um, also the theme of this, um, this session, which is uh, feminist resistance, of course. So how do these women portray individual as well as collective attitudes uh, toward their shared history? And the second point would be, how does Wolf navigate uh, competing demands of justice, individual liberty, uh, rights, and collective, um, rights and collectivity and social responsibility in a society? So, of course, again, while I cannot guarantee that I will be able to answer these questions at the moment, um, I will do my best to at least get us started on the points that uh, I want to develop for this topic and to, uh, to have the, uh, having these questions in mind. Um, and again, these are sort of the conversation points that uh, we hope I, I hope we can all um, 
flesh out later on. So as guided by um, the framework of feminist ethics, it follows that, of course, my analysis should um, have a basic recognition for, I quote, the gender differences in ethical and moral reasoning. And that's from a discussion of feminist ethics by Catherine Norlock. I have also um, somewhat loosely followed uh, this, uh, this uh, framework or the, these three core tenets that have come from um, Rebecca Wisnant, um, although I, of course I acknowledge that it is um, a very simplistic way of putting it, but in terms of just organizing this discussion, um, I have um, based it on these three points, which is that the first that um, the, the first tenet would be that women and men are rational and moral equals, um, but then the second follows that women and men are not currently social and political equals, and thus um, inequality systematically disadvantages women. And that the third, um, given that these first two points um, do not fit together, um, there is a disconnect between one and two, then the third follows that gender inequality is unjust and that it should be ended. So on the first point, which is that um, women and men are rational and moral equals, um, the women in the story organize themselves as a society for asking questions at the same time as they acknowledge that uh, the objects of life were to produce good people and good books. So I interpret this as, um, to, I interpret this to indicate the separate uh, but linked responsibilities of men and women. So on the one hand, you have women as producers of the good people as mothers, but also on the other, you have men producing good books and pictures, pictures and books being the line that's, um, I think, uttered by Clorinda in the story. So what prompts the society to, to band together is Paul's discovery that men have not basically um, met their end of the bargain or have not produced good literature after all and they have devi deviated from that particular expectation. So this compels the women to question how their mothers could have contributed to this anomaly and in turn themselves as well as women. Um, so there is a baseline expectation of goodness to produce these objects of life. So if any of you were there in um, the first day of the conference in Diane presentation of the same story, uh, she references actually the mentions of the word good and true in her discussion and the number of times those words are mentioned. Um, but for me, what also stands out is what becomes immediately apparent is how uh, it has become regular practice for these women. Um, at least we see this in the beginning of the story. It's regular practice for them to um, quote as usual to praise men. Um, so we find that these women, um, as if they are engaged in a storytelling mode, um, and I get that from the line uh, from the story, which says that they drew around the fire. So um, as if also at the same time with that storytelling um, aspect of that scene, there's also as if they are members of an exclusive or a private circle, um, wherein they um, mindlessly or even willingly elevate the status of men in their discussions. And so um, what I find is that this um, praising of men echoes philosophy's conventional view of man as, um, and this is a line from Rebecca Wisnett's study, is um, man is seen as the moral agent, um, the hero, the soldier, the citizen, or the man of virtue. And this comes from her discussion of um, female invisibility in androcentric philosophy. So we can assume that this usual beginning to women's gathering, at least the way that um, we see it at the beginning of the story, is that it is embedded, um, it is one that is embedded itself deeply in their everyday practice without them putting much thought to it, or um, uh, and that is until um, they hear about Paul's discovery in the London Library. So this leads us to the second point, um, or the second claim of feminism, according to Wisnant, which is that women and men are not currently social and political equals. And I'd like to look at that um, core tenet um, in line with uh, Clorinda, who is another character from the story. So Clorinda acknowledges that it is their fault, meaning women's fault, by expecting that men will produce the good that is assigned to them. So Clorinda's initial speech reveals um, how women hold themselves accountable for the failure of men to produce good books, to produce good books. And so the consequence is that they would need to hold off on producing children to avoid such an outcome. 
So the women agree on a vow of chastity that links back to the not just their own expected role as mothers, but also of the mothers that had come before them. And of course, this harks to the, the famous line from a room of one's own. Okay? So that um, they also hark to the longer tradition of women to which they belong. So here's the quote from Florinda, which explain, uh, emphasizes uh, how women's knowledge or intellect, um, what is referred to in the story as reading, um, with, uh, that which affects the roles assigned to both men and women. And this is the passage that um, ends with the society's vow of chastity. So that, um, oh, sorry. Uh, so, all right, so uh, let me see. All right, so this newfound ability to make judgments allows women to assume the role of audience, uh, one that brings them to question how men conduct, conduct themselves in a larger uh, patriarchal society. So we can say this is similar to our own experience or our own position as readers of this story or even um, the readers of uh, Wolf's time who are relatively free to impose judgments on the story and the choices of its characters. So this then brings us to um, Cassandra's uh, function as a neutral spectator or a, a, neutral, um, uh, a neutral spectator and narrator of, this, of the story. So according to Susan Dick, Wolf's decision to tell a society from the point of view of Cassandra may reflect in part a desire to conceal herself behind the voice of another. And this, makes, um, this means that Cassandra also um, tends not to impose an, ev an evaluation uh, on her report to the society's deliberations. And so this leads us to the third point that Wisnant makes, um, and this is the final um, claim that she makes, which is that gender inequality is unjust and that it should be ended. This gathering of women allows for opposing ideas to, em to emerge, which emphasizes the differences and reveals, um, uh, sorry, which emphasizes their differences and reveals Wolf's attempt to let such voices be heard. We as readers become privy to this private club or a secret conversation wherein there is more than one voice who participates um, as they try to make sense of the world around them. Wolf thus imagines a society of women wherein differences or disagreements can begin to coexist, at least among these women. But outside of these women's, outside of this women's society, once men are involved or in that equation, there, there can only be disguises, masquerades, and confusion. So we can see, um, we can further explore this idea of the, especially on the confusion part, uh, when we look at Castalia, who goes off to Oxbridge uh, disguised as a charwoman to work at the professor's office. Um, so the disguise functions here as a tool for women to reveal how um, the quote objects of life have been achieved by men. When Castalia is asked um, by the women if the Oxbridge professors um, helped to produce good, good people and good books, Castalia replies with, um, it never, oh, okay, sorry. I think I missed a slide there, but um, uh, Castalia replies with, it never struck me to ask. Uh, it never occurred to me that they could possibly produce anything. Um, and she is left unimpressed uh, by the output of the professor she has just visited. Um, but this, of course, if you remember, this goes against the basic function of the society, which is to ask questions. So then Castalia reappears three months later, revealing to the society uh, her satisfaction at the same time confusion in answering questions. And this is the quote that you see on the slide. Um, and so uh, this is where she also uh, tells us or reveals to us that she is with child. Um, so Castalia not only goes against the grain by answering instead of asking, but also when she breaks the society's vow by getting pregnant and then reveals herself later as, quote, the impure woman. So according to Christine Rainier, uh, in a society, this impure woman, referring to Castalia, is presented as the woman of the future. Uh, she gives birth to the first girl. Later, we know her name to be Anne. Um, then, uh, rather than being taught to perform the tasks traditionally allotted to women or to believe them in the male principle or the intellect, she will be taught to believe in herself. Um, impurity becomes the springboard to a new era and a new woman. And that is, again, a quote from Christine Rainer. The story does not propose 
um, any resolution, and this is also mentioned by um, Diane in her presentation, uh, showing how the women's attempts only give rise to more questions. Uh, this, is, this is, of course, with no help from men who could not provide women any direct answers um, and can even be said to be deliberately con to be uh, to deliberately con contribute to further confusion. Uh, Castalia recognizes the complexity of what they're facing uh, at the group's final meeting when she says that we shall never come to any conclusion at this rate. Um, it appears that civilization is so much more complex than we had any notion. Cassandra, meanwhile, reports on the society's agreement that, quote, a good man must at any rate be honest, passionate, and unworldly. Uh, but whether or not a particular man possessed those qualities could only be discovered by asking questions, often beginning at a remote distance from the center. The society has at least come to terms with or decided that these are the characteristics of what make a man good, even as they are faced with something with seemingly impossible uncertainty. This shows then that there is clearly no easy way for women to proceed as when they had set out the original objectives of the small, of the small society. And perhaps this isn't helped by the fact that there was a five-year hiatus uh, due to World War I of the society's meeting, and this didn't help um, take things any further beyond um, how they had begun. So to conclude, a society can be seen as Wolf's way of exploring women as moral um, agents at the same time as she challenges the reader to question the capability of these women as moral agents who are navigating this new world in their own terms. But they are inevitably unable to arrive at the concrete resolution due to the institution set up by men. Castalia in the end proposes that women devise a method by which they may, may bear children. This is the quote on your slide. She says it is our only chance. And to this, Cassandra replies that it is too late. Uh, and so she finds hope uh, in this sense. Cassandra finds hope in Anne, uh, who is Castalia's daughter, um, who is uh, essentially a new generation of women who need to rely on themselves and me places the burden on them. Um, and this is uh, what she says, is that once she knows how to read, there's only one thing you can teach her to believe in, and that is herself. While Castalia and Cassandra make attempts at finding a resolution to women's place in society, we as the story's readers are invited to consider how these women respond to the unstable situations that contribute to their beings. Um, we are compelled to, uh, in Wisnes, uh, I take Wisnes' words here, we are compelled to take women seriously as moral agents and ask some questions such as these. How do women understand themselves, perceive the world, and think about moral questions? What, women, what do women think is important and valuable in human life? At the same time, as the women um, in the story go out into the world to seek out for themselves the answers to these very same vital questions. And so before I end my um, presentation, I also acknowledge, of course, and this is not part of the bullet, uh, the points that I raised earlier, um, I, the paper could still also greatly benefit from an integration of A Room of One's Own, Three Guineas, um, as these texts feature Wolf's more fully realized perspectives on Wolf's feminism and could thus inform my reading of the tale in the frame of feminist ethics. Nonetheless, um, for this paper, I have relied on um, the following perspectives, um, as well as, um, of course, as, uh, the one um, uh, once I mentioned earlier, Susan Dick in 1987, but also um, uh, those who have studied Wolf's short stories um, more generally, but also Monday or Tuesday as a whole collection. Uh, that includes um, Selma Meyerowitz and Jane Marcus, uh, Dean Baldwin, Catherine Benzel, and Ruth Hoberman, as well as Nina Skurbeck. Um, later on, um, I also hope to include uh, some ideas that I've gathered so far from the conference, um, namely uh, the insights mentioned in Michael Hart's presentation in the first day of the conference from the, that from his presentation uh, entitled "That this Detestable Place," and like I mentioned earlier, from uh, the session um, in the first day as well in. Uh, from the talks of Leslie Hankins and Diane Gillespie. Uh, so that's it for me. Thanks again for your attention and I look forward to your questions uh, later on in the program. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. That was fabulous. Um, and I'm muted. Barry, you've muted yourself, I think, I'm sorry. 
it says I'm 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 getting very peevish about Zoom. Um, am I muted or not? It's all good now. We can hear you fine. Okay. Oh, so yeah. Yeah, all good. Yes. Well, it tells me that I'm muted, and so I unmute and then I'm muted. That's fun. Um, so I wanted to thank Lauren for her excellent presentation. And I think I'm audible at the moment. And um, our next presenter is Kimberly. And I just wanted to say that I've posted the papers several times in the chat. Um, but if you need uh, me to do that again, um, please tell me uh, if you haven't been able to access them. Okay, so okay, I think- And I am desperately trying to share my screen, which is successful. All the zooming we have done. Do you see it? Okay, good. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> all right. You see it. I'm going right. to be muted. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, it is absolutely delightful to see all of your faces, old and new, uh, and I look forward to seeing you in the flesh once again. Um, Zoom is wonderful, but it's certainly been tedious over the last two and a half years. Um, my paper is titled Daddy's Girls, Fathers, Daughters, and Female Resistance in Virginia Woolf's Three Guineas and Valerie Solanas's Scum Manifesto. Um, I get points deducted because I don't have my work cited on here yet, but if you want that, I can certainly forward you a copy of the paper um, with that included. I also have my dog here in my office with me. So if she starts barking, at the dog walker for the lady next door who's supposed to be here any moment, I will be quickly dashing off the screen and grabbing her and putting her in my lap. Um, so that said, I will begin. On June 30th, 1968, Valerie Solanas, the radical second wave feminist known for roaming the streets of New York, New York City peddling her theories, showed up at Andy Warhol's art studio, The Factory, and shot both he and the art critic Mario Amaya. According to several sources, Solanas had tried convincing Warhol to produce her play, Up Your Ass, to no avail. The shooting, sorry, now I have to make sure I can make my, there we go. Um, sorry, the shooting, as a a Amy Taubin in the Village Voice wrote, had more to do with Solanas's powerlessness and her inability to get Warhol's attention. She wasn't pretty, rich, well-connected, or willing to serve, end quote. Similarly, Solanas's sister Judith observed, Valerie did, quote, Valerie did not want to kill Andy Warhol, the individual, but Warhol the man, the one with the power, the control, the fame, the money, the prestige. Everything came together in one horrendous moment when paranoid delusion fused with intolerable reality. I don't think she planned it, end quote. Solanas turned herself over to police immediately after the shooting and was charged with attempted murder, assault, and legally possessing a gun. Diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, she served three years in prison and underwent care at a psychiatric institute. In 1967, a year prior to her attempt on Warhol's life, Solanas had self-published Scum Manifesto, an astute and deliberately shocking polemic critiquing patriarchy and capitalism as fostering a dangerous version of masculinity. Following her release from prison, Solanas continued avidly promoting the Scum Manifesto on the streets of New York City. As Ellen Berry notes in her excellent book, Negative Aesthetics and Feminist Critique, Quote, aggressive, incendiary, and laced with profanity, suffused with sardonic humor and homicidal rage, riddled with logical contradictions, as well as prescient analysis. Solanus's one woman society for cutting up men, scum, has been easy to dismiss as the invention of one mentally unhinged woman, historically noteworthy only for her failed intent to assassinate Andy Warhol, end quote. By continuing to sensationalize the acronym, the latest edition published by Verso, as you can see on the screen, um, in 2004 with an introduction by Avital Ronell, places a box cutter front and center on the cover. Even today's publishers relegate Solanus' words to the annals of female monstrosity. Lost in the emphasis on the acronym SCUM, which understandably may still make men in the audience shudder, and the cultural fascination with her schizophrenia and her assault on Warhol is the incisive and yes, cutting analysis her manifesto offers. Like Virginia Woolf's polemic Three Guineas, published 29 years earlier by the Hogarth Press, 
Solanus's manifesto ruthless, ruthlessly indicts a society guilty of promoting a toxic version of masculinity that must be confronted head on. If women don't get their asses in gear fast, writes Solanus, we may very well all die. I think this, the 21st century, which thus far has been no less violent or misogynist than the 20th, as known by both Wolf and Solanus, or I, I'm sorry, I think in this, the 21st century, which thus far has been no less violent or misogynist than the 20th, as known by Wolf and Solanus, these words indisputably still resonate. However distant Valerie Solanus and Virginia Woolf's lives may seem from one another at first glance, especially given their class differences, they nevertheless shared more than a few life experiences. True, socioeconomically speaking, their lives could not be further apart. Woolf, we know to have been raised in an upper-class British literary family that provided her, her financial stability growing up, the stability she continued to experience in her marriage to Leonard Woolf. By contrast, born 50 years after Wolf in 1936, and on the other side of the pond, Solanus was raised in a much less economically and socially stable family, and as a young adult in New York City, found herself forced to eke out a living, begging and prostituting herself on the street. Nevertheless, both women shared tumultuous childhoods, sexual abuse at the hands of close male relatives, mental illness, and a fiery commitment to social justice. In the brief time I have today, I will argue that Wolf and Solanus's critiques of capitalism, patriarchy, and most specifically father-daughter relationships in Three Guineas and the Scum Manifesto, respectively, launch surprisingly similar discursive attacks on the societies in which they lived. <laughs> Reevaluated in the context of the Me Too movement and the poisonous miasmus left behind by the Trump era, these two women's words hurled at a common enemy offer strategies of resistance that continue to be relevant as we gather and throw our own words and bodies against the seemingly intransigent law of the father. I will close by briefly referencing two other more recent feminist texts indebted to Three Guineas, Virginie Despons, and I pronounce that terribly in French, uh, King Kong Theory and Andrea Shoes, Females. At the center of Wolf's Three Guineas is her unforgiving analysis of why the daughters of educated men really have no business whatsoever in advising the barrister on how he might best advocate the prevention of war. As this audience well knows, the complete irrelevance to these daughters of a society created by and for men and designed to continue preserving male dominance, authority, and power is driven home by Wolf at every turn. Her tone in that regard runs from ironic to satirical to unabashedly strident, and most delightfully for this reader anyway, furious. Rage, petrol, matches, take this guinea and set fire to the old hypocrisies. Naomi Black has noted that the feminist response to Three Guineas, which initially was somewhat critical of its reliance only on gender difference as a prominent source of critique, I should have said only in quotes, um, by the end of the 20th century was increasingly cognizant of the book's political significance in light of its comprehensive, quote, opposition to all forms of hierarchy, now understood as including the oppressive structures of sexism and heterosexism, in addition to class, racism, and imperialism, even though it made no reference to sexual orientation or to issues of age and bodily function, end quote. By the beginning of the 21st century, Black notes, Three Guineas anger and satire were much more positively received, especially in America. As we'll see shortly, Three Guineas is clearly an important precursor to radical second wave texts like Solanus's Scum Manifesto. In Three Guineas, Wolf's narrator consistently queries how the daughters of educated men can possibly defend the fabric, the fabric of a civilization denying them full political agency and subjectivity. Quote, let us never cease from thinking have I lost touch with my slides? Yes. Uh, <laughs> let us never, I certainly have. Well, maybe I haven't, I'm sorry. This is a new experience here. Um, whoops, yeah, now I'm way ahead. Ah! Okay, hold on, hold on. Okay, can you see it? Um, 
All right, we want rewind the quote, never let us never cease from thinking, what is this civilization in which we find ourselves? What, what are the, uh, these ceremonies and why should we take part in them? What are these professions and why should we make money out of them, end quote. Any further effort to understand this civilization involves the careful dissection of a disease taking men as its host. Infantile fixation, motivated, well, tells us by fear. She turns briefly to the psychologist, read Freud, who have pronounced such fear to be premised on the Oedipus complex at the heart of which lies castration anxiety, quipping that since, quote, the professor has defined it and described it so accurately, then no daughter of an educated man, however educated she may be, can miscall it or misinterpret it in the future, end quote. Should we rest there, we would follow Freud, who ultimately declared that it is not so much male anxiety that informs the Oedipus complex as the daughter's desire for her father, a turn which through Wolf does not call it out, which though Wolf does not call it out explicitly, takes us away from the strong feeling, a powerful jealousy aroused in fathers when there is no any suggestion that a woman be admitted to a priesthood, a college, or even to an economy in which her labor might be rewarded with a living wage. It is thus not a daughter's repressed desire for her father, but that father's jealousy and paternal drive for power that must be analyzed. Quote, when the father is infected by the infantile fixation, it has a threefold power. He has nature to protect him, law to protect him, and property to protect him, end quote. The strong force emanating from this paternal fixation is all the stronger, Wolf tells us, because it is concealed and naturalized by a society sanctioning the father's fixations and neuroses as normal and legitimate. In this atmosphere, infected as it is by the toxicity generated by the father's infantile fixations, phrases like the emancipation of women, Wolf flatly declares, are equally inexpressive and corrupt. Having established this futility, Wolf moves us past all tags and labels Real to real emotions that inspire the daughter's opposition to the infantile fixation of the father's. Beneath those tears is anger, and anger, Wolf defiantly conveys, is far more powerful than labels. Labels kill and constrict. It is not then the tired old world word freedom that women want. They want, like Antigone, not to break laws, but to find the law, not to break free of the ties that bind, but to burn it all down and create a new and just law that is not premised on societies, which are mere, quote, fathers in public massed together in professions even more subject to the fatal disease than fathers in private, end quote. To deflect from their own insecurities, the inadequacy of their own masculinity, therein lies the rub, this infantile fixation leads fathers to point fingers at women. It is, it is the fathers proclaim women who have failed. But such accusations merely deflect attention away from the true horror that is a photograph as we know of a man, the dictator, the tyrant, who Wolf tells us occupies both the private and the public wor world, uniting the tyrannies of the one with the tyrannies of the other. The truth laid bare by this photograph leaves the, leaves the daughters of educated men no choice but to join a society of outsiders where they will refuse the father's methods, interrupt the bray of the gramophones, the ceremonies, the marches, practice an ethical stance premised always unseeing from different angles, create new affinities premised on new words and new methods, and stay outside a society grounded on a figure, the photograph of the man, the dictator, who Wolf, speaking directly to the daughters of that man, says, we nevertheless cannot dissociate ourselves because we are ourselves that figure. We are not passive, and this is Wolf, we are not, as you most probably all know, we are not passive spectators doomed to unresisting disobedience, but by our thoughts and actions can ourselves change that figure, end quote. It is then the daughters who are left responsible for resisting, refusing, and altering the specter of masculinity captured by that photograph. Okay, now we're at the right place. If Solanus's tone in the Scum Manifesto is more shocking and her language crasser than is Wolf's in Three Guineas, she points to the same disease, the same infantile fixation, 
pushing the analysis even further to reveal that the true fear behind the infantile fixation is men's desire to be women and their ensuing anxiety that they might thus be perceived as feminine. The critical tendency to marginalize Solanus's hardcore critique and indictment of patriarchal masculinity no doubt has much to do with the fact that within the first sentence, Solanus's narrator advocates with astonishing confidence the eradication of the government, the economy, and the male gender. And this is the quote on the slide, um, quote, life in this society being at best an utter bore and no aspect of society being at all relevant to women that remains to civic minded, responsible, thrill seeking females only to overthrow the government, eliminate the money system, institute complete automation and destroy the male sex, end quote. The manifesto situates Solanus's narrator as Wolf's quintessential outsider without mentioning her predecessor by name. As Avital Ranel notes in her introduction to the Verso edition, Solanus occupies, quote, a non-space, barely representable or representative. She adopts the language of a pest and opens a field of startling intensities by saying the unspeakable and then vanishing with the near notarization of what she had dared to say, end note. Renell further observes that though the text at times mimes a delusional frenzy, it more importantly gives us a girl Nietzsche who bravely goes to the place where delusion and the real catastrophically meet. While Solanus's rage may strike some readers as delusional, Scum Manifesto is far from a delusional text. Her strategies of resistance are perhaps more raucously expressed than Wolf's, but their intention is much the same burn it down because there can be no progress for women in a society premised on laws designed solely to preserve male power and conceal male inadequacy. Quote, to be male is to be deficient. This is Solanus, emotionally limited. Maleness is a deficiency disease and males are emotional cripple, cripples. Women, declares Solanus, don't have penis envy. Men have pussy envy, end quote. Wanting deep down to be female, but consumed by the hatred of those qualities he has, he has ordained to be female, passive, passivity, emotion, the ability to empathize or identify, men are responsible for war, Solanus tells us, money, marriage and prostitution, and a social code that, quote, ensures perfect blandness, unsullied by the slightest trace or feeling or upsetting opinion. And worst of all, for the mental illness, she tells us, that is fatherhood. The patriarchal version of masculinity Solanus so viciously indicts find its, finds its pen, penultimate expression in daddy. Quote, daddy only wants what is best for daddy. That is peace and quiet, pandering to his delusion of dignity, respect, a good reflection on himself, status, and the opportunity to control and manipulate, or if he's an enlightened father, to give guidance. According to Solanus's critique, the conventionally gendered expectations that have traditionally gone with fatherhood exact an equally harmful toll on males and females. The boy, scared shitless of and re respecting his father, complies and becomes just like daddy, that model of manhood, the all-American ideal, the well-behaved heterosexual dullard. The effect of fatherhood on females is to make them quote, male dependent, passive, domestic, animalistic, insecure, approval and security seekers, cowardly, humble, respectful of authorities and men, half dead, trivial, dull, conventional, and thoroughly contemptible daddy's girls. If Wolf's Three Guineas articulates a politics of resistance premised on refusing the law of the father, interrupting the noise of his pomp and circumstance, practicing an ethical scene premised on the view from different angles, creating new relational affinities and connections that exceed those dictated by patriarchal masculinity and society, and participating in a society of outsiders, Solanus's politics of resistance, arguably more audacious in its delivery and visceral in its attacks, also offers up strategies for pushing back. Quote, in actual fact, the female function is to explore, discover, invent, solve problems, crack jokes, make music, all with love. In other words, create a magic world, end quote. Sounding like the child of the 60s she was, 
Sol Sol Solanus's magic world necessitates refusing the role of daddy's girl, refusing the commodification of, quote, her pussy, end quote, embracing her own feelings and sensations, reclaiming the love that, quote, can exist only between two secure, freewheeling, independent, groovy female females, end quote, and leaving men. Quote, if all women simply left men, refused to have anything to do with them ever, all men, the government, and the national economy would collapse entirely, end quote. Solanus's indirect answer to Wolf's injunction that women can best be, can, quote, can best help prevent war by not repeating your words and following your methods, but by finding new words and new methods, not by joining your society, but by remaining outside your society, is scum. Scum will, quote, systematically fuck up the system, end quote, by becoming members of the unwork force, the fuck up force, refusing, for example, to charge for merchandise as a sales girl, unworking at a job until fired, then get a new job to unwork at it. Scum will destroy all useless and harmful objects, take over the airwaves, couple bust, kill men who are not in the men's auxiliary of men, that auxiliary being comprised of those men who are actively committed to unmanning men. Scum is in essence, not just about jamming the system, but about quote, destroying the system, not attaining rights within it, end quote. Because those rights, given how corrupt the system itself is, cannot be salvaged. While these methods may not have been entirely pal palatable to Wolf, they certainly meet her insistence that the emotion genera generated by the photographs of dead children and bombed houses, quote, demands something more positive than a name written on a, sh a sheet of paper, an hour spent listening to speeches, a check written for whatever sum we can afford, some more energetic, some more active method of expressing our belief that war is barbarous, that war is inhuman, that war is insupportable, horrible, and beastly seems required. What active method is open to us? As a rhetorical act of the imagination, Solanus's scum certainly offer us, certainly offers us a more active method, even if we might find it neither feasible nor ultimately palatable to carry out. Oops, I am behind myself again. Um, other more recent feminist polemics, like the French writer Virginie Despond's King Kong theory and the trans writer and activist Andrea Shoes, females also carry forward what I find most relevant about Wolf's Three Guineas in these, which are our precarious times. And that is its interrogation and Solanus's too of what we have come in some circles to refer to as toxic masculinity. Wolf and Solanus and more recently Despantes and Shu, and Shu remind us that at the core of our currently predominantly white male conservative backlash against Roe v. Wade, against managing the, pur the purchase and sale of assault rifles and AK-47s that are marketed as providing the male gender with its quote, man card, end quote, and against parents of trans and or non-binary children having the ability to provide gender affirming healthcare to their kids is an effort to shore up that most fragile of constructs, patriarchal masculinity. The active method we need to be practicing most now then is a deliberate and methodological social and cultural undoing of patriarchal masculinity until it meets what Wolf and Solanus would no doubt both affirm is its well-deserved and long overdue demise. Thank you. Kimberly, could you share your um, PowerPoint um, in the uh, chat as well? Sure, if I can figure out how to do that. Or you, um, could, yes. um, you could email it to me and I could do it. Okay, okay. I think. Um, because it obviously has um, other things that you aren't actually yeah. um, using in the paper itself. Yeah, sure. Okay. And we need to know what your background is here. <laughs> oh, what my background in Solanus is? <laughs> or in Scum? <laughs> no, no. In terms of you, you removed your um, image and it's, it's your... Oh. Um, oh, I see. Okay. Your screen. Can you, can you see me? 
No, we can see you now. It was just when you took it down. Okay. All right. Sorry. Was sorry. On your Mac. <laughs> oh, Zoom. All right. Zoom is what it is. I know. Not entirely a thing of affection, um, but we. Will I will email the PowerPoint to you. Great. Okay. And um, I think we're ready to talk. And we have um, many thank yous in the chat and um, applause and um, fire. <laughs> Uh, which is definitely worth looking at. Um, and I think uh, that there are many questions and comments and observations that will uh, mesh with what has already been said. Uh, what an amazing panel, says Marie. <laughs> what a brilliant panel, says Valerie. <laughs> uh, these papers were great. Let's talk. And a hand has been raised. Um, yes, speak, Ellen. Okay, I was, I, 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 all, pe all three papers were very, very interesting. I have to admit, I had never heard of Valerie Solanos. So I'm very <laughs> grateful for you to tell me that, nor had I heard of the other two women. I just have to admit it. Um, one difference, I've taught, I've tried to teach a couple, I have taught three guineas a couple of times. And one of the problems is the indirect or roundabout way in which he does it. And of course, the Solanus is so very direct. Uh, the, because you brought it together, I never really thought about it. But um, it seems to me that a society is a very raw piece. That it's very direct and that everything, I mean, this woman goes to be a charwoman and she comes back pregnant. At the very end, they're weeping. All the sorts of things that are said there are said, seems to me, in terms of 1920, of course, it's not 2022, or it was whenever she wrote that thing. But I think it uh, just, to, oh, it's only a remark that it seems to me that a society in its time is speaking as directly and rawly as the Scum Manifesto. Um, and so I'm glad you brought the two of them together that way. Uh, thank you. Okay, um, is someone else? Yes, um, there's probably a pause. Okay, Gwen, um, are you commenting there? It, well, I was just saying that uh, I think Leslie had a question earlier that was posted a little while ago for, for Lauren. Please, Leslie yes, wrote, yes. so happy to hear a fine paper on a society. I have just completed my edition of the story, which is on sale during the conference. Question. What do you make of the ending of the story? Yes, all right. Uh, thank you. I was just going to get to that, I think, in response to um, what Ellen said earlier. So thank you. Um, thank you to Leslie and Ellen for those comments and, and the question. Uh, I was thinking about it earlier in terms of the ending, like you said, um, and I think, Leslie, you brought this up in your presentation, that the story is there are humorous uh, there is a humorous aspect to it as well but at the same time it's a very strong ironic tone that um, Wolf also brings about in the story but I think what I noticed there is that the beginning there's uh, crying as well as in the end of the story so it's sort of book ended by those um, crying um, scenes but um, the way that I read the crying of Anne at the end is while there may be a sense of hopelessness there I, I kind of Kind of, you know, this is uh, it's it's uh, now that the burden is on the, the the next generation to take on this task or take on the asking or answering questions um, in re with regards to how to make sense of the world around them. There's also a sense of um, I, I can also sense a sense of um, exploration still on the part of Wolf because again, in terms of the context, she's exploring still these ideas that will become much more fully realized when she writes um, A Room of One's Own and Three Guineas. So uh, based on at least, uh, of course, uh, based on the, the other scholars that I've read as well who have written about it, this is uh, in terms of how it was received also critically, um, it was thought of as something that was either you know really bad or something that was um, that had something to say still. But I think in terms of where it was specifically in its context or in its time, um, because I think that sort of um, because because it is largely a conversation among women, they're having these different questions raised and ideas raised. It is also 
from my point of view, I, I also see it as Wolf is still herself exploring these questions and ideas, and she'd rather bring this up in terms of the, uh, the short story, in terms of these are um, the conversations that we want to have and that we should be having. Um, but then, you know, whatever, wherever this brings us um, is probably not going to happen in our generation, but it will happen in the next. And that's why I, I, I really loved how um, Diane ended her, her presentation, uh, because in that presentation, she said that uh, she ended it with questions and she ended it with that idea of, are we now at, at the time? Are we now at, are we now that figure of Anne who has to take on, are we at that time where that has happened or that is yet has yet to happen? So um, I think, again, it's sort of all of those things um, happening all together that um, that's why I, I really gravitated towards this story as well in relation to um, presenting a paper to, in this conference as well. So I, that's why I, I think I kept on saying as well that I wanted to have a st uh, at least engage in conversation with everyone here as well about it because um, that is exactly I think what's happening and what becomes uh, what makes the story uh, so exciting and can be such a, a great source of, of ideas for all of us here as well. Um, Kelly, it looks like you have your hand up and thank you so much for um, Lauren what you've already said. <laughs> thank you all for such great papers. I love them all. Um, this question is probably mostly for Rasha and Kimberly. Um, so I've actually also been sort of working with the idea of silence and language and action in my dissertation with Wolf, uh, but more so between the acts and the voyage out and to the lighthouse. Um, and as Kimberly was talking about Three Guineas, which I'm also kind of working with, I was thinking about yes, this action um, and sort of opposing action to silence um, and setting fire, being opposed to the scratching on the matchbook that is the conversation that uh, Rachel Vinray talks about in Voyage Out. Um, but I was also really thinking about during Rasha's talk, this idea of silence as resistance, but also like, what about masculine silence? that's like really highly valued, right? All these scholars um, have to have that silence as space to think and do their work, right? And when you were discussing uh, Mrs. Ramsey's silence during her reading, she is doing this sort of active thing. And I was wondering if we could, if maybe one of you could speak to sort of the is reading and silence in that way, in that mode, reading and studying active enough in terms of, you know, finding that more active method that Kimberly was talking about? Um, how does reading and the silence that that requires kind of fit into that. Okay, I would go first if Kimberly don't mind. Thank you, Kelly, for the question. And um, to be honest with you, one of the first question is um, that happens to me when I start writing this paper is the definition of silence. How could we define silence in this novel? And I've, I've as I stated in the in the uh, paper, that some people. Um, have talked about silence as the lack of speech. Um, those moments were, uh, uh, let's say, um, characters do not respond um, sometimes in, 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 in like, so let's say the, the punctuation or lack of words uh, in, the, in the written text. Um, I decided to go with the approach of um, considering those moments when characters have their, um, their stream of consciousness those moments of staying alone, having this silent silence or let's call a space in which they are start thinking and reflecting and pondering about their surroundings as moments of silence as well. Um, this takes silence from being a lack of something into um, a spatial structure in which um, the characters um, um, they say, try to think more about 
what they want and what um, um, and 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 their say situation or positions of from of the uh, on the things that um, are happening around them. Um, I hope this answered you. But this is the, this is what I think and uh, related to the definition of silence in the novel. I'll answer that question. Then I'm also looking at marks in the chat. Um, I think one of the, and I, I get to teach a wolf seminar this fall, which I'm just ecstatic about. So I'm gonna be going back to the beginning and moving through the entire <laughs> oeuvre. Um, but I think one of the things that's unique about um, Three Guineas is that Wolf realizes at that point, not that reading doesn't matter, not that writing doesn't matter, but that it it has not been enough. So one of the things as, as I gestured toward in, my paper that I find so delightful in that text is the physicalization of her anger, right? Grab the petrol, grab the matches, burn it down, right? Is, and dance around the house, let the windows blaze, um, I think is, is really powerful. And I will say, one, one of the women in my writing group said, how the hell are you gonna make Virginia Woolf and Valerie Solanas talk to one another? And that was kind of an accident. I've taught um, a graduate class now for three semesters, not consecutively, but on raging women. And I couldn't do Wolf specifically because it was supposed to be an American class, but Wolf is certainly ghosting every choice I made, um, I started with, with Antigone, which is not exactly American either, obviously. Um, but when I got to Solanus, I was just struck, right, by the fact that even though Solanus may not have even known Wolf, I don't, I don't, I don't know, may not have read Wolf, um, the nev nevertheless, there was a resonance there. And one of the things that astonished me is that even in a graduate class, and this is this is to answer Mark's question. The thing that the students fixated on was that she shot Andy Warhol. It was like being in a bad undergraduate class where the students can't get past the fact that that Wolf drowns herself, right? They commit suicide and that therefore just erases everything she's ever said. So I don't know if the second wave radical feminists are necessarily any more palatable, but in the back of my mind, um, one of the things that I, I wanna think about and work through, especially given the contemporary texts that are coming out that I think resonate so well with um, Three Guineas is whether or not we can't revalue those second wave feminists at a time when you know we're at that impasse again. We've talked and talked and talked and we've written and written and written um, and here we are, right? Protesting the same old shit as the famous sign goes. Um, and I think, I think the costs are just getting higher and higher. So, so I guess, Mark, what I would say to that is, I think there's a, a revaluing of um, those second wave radical feminists that needs to be happening and a reacquainting of the current generations with that work because it has been dismissed as ugly and um, angry and you know too forceful and all of those things. Um, so. so um, Kimberly, there's a post from Linda about um, Hothead Paisan. I do not. That's great. Which you obviously <laughs> should know about. Um, <laughs> and um, there's also, and I'm going way back, um, Marie, you had brought up um, Beauvoir. And um, making that connection might be interesting. Yeah, I was just because as as some of you might know, I'm working on uh, Wolf's uh, psychoanalytic receptions and especially uh, Oedipal readings and even more specifically Lacanian and post Lacanian receptions. And basically what was very interesting to me in Beauvoir in The Second Sex is that just like Wolf and Three Guineas reverses Oedipus saying, oh, actually it's not, you know, um, it's not uh, uh, daughters who are basically stuck on their dads. It's, it's, the, it's the other way around. It's, it's, it's uh, fatherly jealousy. Beauvoir is kind of doing the same thing because she phenomenologizes the, the idea of penis envy. And she says, well, actually um, it's not about the visual impression that, oh, uh, as a girl, 
uh, being naked in front of you, a boy being naked as well, little girl, I see that you have something and I have nothing, which is, by the way, obviously a very uh, androcentric male to, to see things. But what I'm saying, it's, it's, a, it's even more uh, pernicious than that. It's because the, the, the penis obviously goes with privileges that women want to have it. And this is a very different story. It is because the parents treat you differently. It is because they react differently to your anger, to your demands, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and obviously, because things happen to you very differently in life, um, that that this that there can be said to be a penis envy, but it's not, it's everything that it represents. It's not the penis in itself. And I just was finding this kind of reversal very interesting. Um, so that was it. It was a great addition. Um, and we have several um, other comments um, and a shortage on time. Um, Lauren, you uh, weighed in on what Leslie had said. I don't know if you want to share that as a discussion. And Gwen um, has pointed out that it's essential to read um, a book recommended by Kimberly. <laughs> so, um, and yes, The Bridge Called My Back is a ancient but fabulous um, resource. So anybody want to say something? Um, uh, oh yeah, I'll just comment on, in, uh, comment on that, um, the conversation with uh, Leslie on the chat. Uh, I think that also takes me back to the idea that there's this lack of resolution uh, that's provided by joining and being part of the society. So that um, again, there's a big, a large part of that um, story. Really, what I find is that it's Wolf's engaging us in that conversation. She's making us part of that um, that situation that doesn't just involve this small society of women, um, but rather of seeing as what happened to them when they went into these spaces, uh, which are practically patriarchal spaces, um, they weren't able to get the answers that they, they, they probably um, were looking for, but rather among themselves, at least, they found that they could rely on those, um, on something at least, even if that something may not be as um, concrete yet as uh, they wanted it to be. So uh, like you said, I, I completely agree with that. That's sort of this idea that this is ongoing and um, this is something that just has to, um, just has to be further developed and as, as, as we see of course later on it will become much more strongly pronounced when she writes um, her, um, her, her next essays and uh, but yes I mean even to this day when we read it it still um, should still um, send us uh, that message right? to keep questioning to maybe even keep trying and answering these things for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So um, Kimberly's po posted some further comments about Chu and um, about a connection to um, Orlando. We have technically one minute left. Um, so I wanna make a pitch to the three presenters, but also to anyone else who's present um, to remind people that the miscellany accepts 2,500 um, word submissions. And it would be fantastic to have all three papers from this um, conference uh, panel. And um, there's obviously going to be other publications coming from the, um, the meetings, but you can obviously take a small sliver of something out of something that's going to be longer and to share it with um, the readership across the globe is certainly um, a wonderful opportunity because it's not only um, in a print format, it's also online. And so if you're interested, please send me something. I would be deeply grateful. I think this was an amazing conversation and um, the papers are stunning. This was absolutely inspiring. And I see little hearts and applause and <laughs> other things going on in the chat. Um, so if, if you want to stay for a few more minutes and talk, I'd be happy to do so, but technically we're done. And so applause. For yeah, thank fantastic. you. Thank you so much, Barra. Thank you. It was just wonderful. <laughs> so thank you. And I'm going to save the chat. <laughs> so, okay. If anybody else wants to weigh in, this is the moment. Thanks, Barra. Kimberly, you were amazing as always. <laughs>
and it's lovely to meet Rasha and Ro Lauren for I think. No, I really, I really want to see everybody in person again. Yeah, I hope, I hope. But, but I will say this has been, oh my gosh, this has been flawless. I have never been been on any Zoom production that has been so well orchestrated, easy to get on. It's just been, it's been, been amazing. So kudos to Amy. I don't think Amy is here, but um, yeah. If it was going to be done, it has been done stupendously well. Yes. And um, I'm hoping that next year will be on, on the ground, but also possibly hybrid for those who cannot travel. Yeah, exactly. Oh. And I, I think that's the other um, silver lining to all of this, that Zoom has given us a way to be present when we can't, if, if we're unable health-wise or whatever, to, to be able to physically be present. Yeah, and uh, it may or may not be, you know, come to fruition, but it would be delightful to be able to see people on a screen. And from what um, Jane DeGay said, um, and it depends entirely on the institution, but she has hybrid classes that work perfectly and everybody can hear each other and everybody can see each other. And I wouldn't want to run one of them. <laughs> No, but apparently, I mean, she's, she's, you know, as if this is just, you know, you have yeah. complete control over it and is not a catastrophe. Um, yeah. so, so I think probably we should um, go and have coffee or whatever, you know, a snack or lunch or whatever it is across the globe. Um, this was fabulous. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Um, I'll send you my email. Thank you, Leslie. Okay. I saw your message as well. Thanks so much. Alrighty. Thank yeah. you, Vara. Okay. Thank you, Rasha yeah. and Kimberly. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah. Rasha, you were fantastic. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> okay. Vara, I'll take you up on that offer to submit something okay. to the miscellany for Rasha sure. <laughs> I will. Thank, Thank you so much, Vara. Appreciate so much. that. We'll keep in okay. touch. Thank you. Okay. Let's Thank you. See you guys later. See you later. <laughs> Okay, yeah, we're leaving. I'll try. I'll try to stay up for it because it, I'm, it's ten thirty in the evening here in Manila. So yes. take a nap. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'll probably okay. do that. Best to do okay. that. Thank you. Thanks again. Bye. See you.